OK, what I want to talk to, do, talk to you today about uh, is, is the evidence for coastal settlement uh, in Northumberland, particularly focusing on the role of fishing. And I'm, although much of my work on Lindisfarne has been focused on um, early medieval period, what I'm talking about today is primarily going to be about the kind of broadly 11th to, to 16th century. So it's, it's slightly later than, than much of my work. And obviously, it, it all needs to be prefaced with, with the usual, this is work in progress disclaimer. Um, when looking at coastal landscapes in Northumberland, I think anyone who's been to Northumberland knows that the, the coast is very di distinctive, it's very attractive. Uh, we have some of the sand dunes, or many of the sand dunes, which, which we've just been hearing about from, from David. And, and again, our sand dunes materialised around the same, same point in, in the later Middle Ages. Um, also, we have sites like sea houses and Beadnell, which are kind of tourist honeypots because they are seen as kind of typical fishing villages, so we'll problematise that uh, a little bit uh, in, in a minute. Um, but I've become increasingly interested in, in the role of fishing um, as part of the, 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 the medieval medieval economy of, of this area and, and indeed the, the medieval, the post medieval uh, economy. And one, one of the things, one of the, one of the ways I found very helpful in, in thinking about these coastal landscapes is this notion of maritime cultural landscapes. Now, anyone who's ever dealt with maritime or marine archaeology will have come across this concept. It was developed by uh, the Scandinavian archaeologist Krista Westerdahl, who tried to integrate um, traditional Kind of land terrestrial based approaches to archaeology with a, a view from the sea. He was trying to get over this kind of land sea binary. And as a maritime archaeologist, he was he was emphasizing that when we're studying the sea, we need to be not just looking at the sea or just at the land. We need to be thinking about the relationships between the two. So that includes looking at obviously things like boats, but also ports and harbours. And also, as he developed this idea, he increasingly drew in the idea of looking at the symbolic aspects of, of his maritime maritime landscapes. I know I want to kind of take this as an idea. I mean, it's an idea which has had some critiques recently, but I still think it's quite a useful tool to, for thinking about uh, these coastal landscapes in, in our study area. And I'm going to look at two kind of case studies. First of all, a Holy Island specific case study, and then, then kind of pan out and think about coastal landscapes more widely across, across the Northumberland from, from the Tyne to the Tweed. And I'm, on the map on the left just gives us some of the, some of the key sites I'll be talking about. Um, when we look at the evidence for medieval fishing in Northumberland, we have obviously two sets of evidence. You've got the documentary textual sources uh, and we've got the uh, archaeology. Um, and, and in a very general scale, it's possible to, using these twin source, source, sources of information, to kind of identify two broad ways in which fishing worked uh, in, in, in society and economy uh, in, in Northumberland. First of all, what we've got what we might call the kind of urban or proto-urban fishing settlements. So these include places like South Shields and North Shields, uh, places like Berwick, um, some interesting attempts to develop a, or stimulate uh, fishing settlements at places like Walksworth, Walkworth and uh, Alnmouth. And these are, these are where we have uh, settlements where we have evidence for fairly full-time fishing, full-time fishermen uh, who aren't working across different different economic niches during different times of the year, uh, and they are providing fish for burgeoning urban markets, and particularly important is the role of monastic houses, uh, particularly places like the uh, Durham Priory at Durham itself, in, in stimulating demand and supporting uh, supply. This, these, these kind of points in the landscape lie against a broader backdrop of what we might call small scale subsistence fishing, managed locally, relatively low investment, low infrastructure, and the evidence kind of implies that it's something which is quite, quite seasonal. Um, I'm going to look at two of these um, examples of, of, of both these kinds of settlements. Um, we can start with thinking about uh, the role of, of Durham Priory, and there's been some really useful work done recently, which has really helped understand the, the role of fish uh, in the life of Durham Priory. There's been the uh, major excavations at Durham uh, in the kitchen at, at, at Durham itself, but we've also got new additions of things like the Durham Priory accounts. Um, and this, this, this shows us very clearly that Durham Priory was involved in kind of development of fisheries 
of fishermen going out from South Shields, from Hartlepool, uh, and from Holy Island. We'll talk more about that in a minute. These are places where there's clearly direct involvement with fishing by by the the Mastic community. Now, obviously, we have uh, uh, the the almost by definition, these are fishing settlements. These are essentially coastal sites. But what's interesting is that Dur Durham Priory account talks about a, a major fish processing centre at Wardley, and Wardley is kind of just just kind of there. It's it's about ten miles, maybe a little bit more inland. So it's a reminder that the um, the kind of threads of of the maritime fishing world don't just exist on the coast. And, and the fact, presumably, at Wardley, large quantities of fish, I'm, I'm guessing herring, are being brought up the Tyne and processed relatively far, relatively far inland. So it's a reminder that fishing isn't something which is purely, purely coastal. We also know that kind of fishing was part of people's kind of the wider world of, of fish uh, in, intrudes on people's lives more generally. So, for example, the Bolden book, which is a, a kind of rental, a rental book uh, for the Priory of Durham, talks about the men of Darlington having labour service, uh, including movement of herring and salts. And of course, salt is itself is a coastal resource and very important for the pre preservation of fish. So the men of Darlington, and of course, those of you who know the area know that Darlington's not by the sea. There is no Darlington Riviera. Uh, these these men of, men of Darlington are presumably moving, walking off to Hartlepool to carry the fish and salt back up, back up to Durham. And we know from the documentary sources as well that the, the, the monasteries are consuming a wide range of different types of fish. So kind of white fish from the North Sea, things like kind of cod, cod family, a salmon coming down, particularly along the coast of North Northumberland from a tweed, shellfish, herring. Uh, they're, they're really it's clear that people are exploiting a, a wide range of ecological niches and would have needed a wide range of different types of technology to to uh, to catch the fish and also these things would have happened at different times of the year. Things like herring have very distinct seasonal migration patterns. Um, so it's a very complicated uh, process. This isn't just a case of going out to sea and getting some fish. It's much more sophisticated. If we home in on, on Holy Island, um, obviously we have the, the, the Priory of Holy Island. Uh, it's a daughter house of, um, of uh, Durham. Uh, it's it's refounded in the in in, in the late 11th century, um, and we see um, the role of fish both in uh, the archaeology, some of the archaeological work I've been doing with my collaborators, Dig Ventures, but also in in some of the textual textual sources. We have some of the Priory account records from Holy Islands, which give us a, an interesting insight into the way in which fish uh, were part of the economy of the of, of 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 the monastery. And it's clear that we can identify three kind of modes or ways in which the the monastery was was acquiring fish. There was in kind exchange. It was kind of exchanging exchanging objects or, or, or services for for fish from the local local population. There were tides. And, and we'll come back to fish ties later on, but it's, it's very common that places like uh, major settlements like North Shields and South Shields were being tithed uh, in very large numbers of, of herring in, in particular. And also it's clear from the Priory account records that the, 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 the Priory of Holy Island was involved directly in fishing itself and had its own boats and its own fishing, fishing equipment. Um, it's quite useful to think about the evidence we have for the spatial uh, a, a range and organisation of, of Holy Island, a Holy Island village uh, when it comes to fishing. Today, most I imagine a lot of you will know the island. Uh, there's, there have been major changes in, 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 in the la aspects of that landscape uh, since, since uh, the medieval period. We've already, we've already heard about sand dunes, uh, but they're mainly on the north side of the village. But the biggest change around the, the this is down here at the bottom of this picture. This is where the Priory is. The major change in the local uh, environment is there was a large open lagoon behind the line of the current current harbour, which was open water until until the 18th century at least. Um, Traditionally, the, the, the village has been seen as something quite small and compact, surrounded by you know, open fields and traditional kind of uh, medieval medieval landscape. Uh, and when we look at the uh, this is this is uh, from Kevin Walsh's PhD on, on some of the, uh, the coastal features, and it's based on a 1725 estate map which showed the, the village and the surrounding fields. And we have a kind of fairly typical um, infield system and then extensive kind of commons and stuff uh, further further afield. Sorry, my, my computer's just doing something strange. Yeah. Um, 
But one of the things our field work has done has shown that actually this pattern's a little bit more complicated. Um, as part of our, uh, our initial phase of, of field work, we did large scale geophysics uh, around around this, the village core of, of Holy Island. And just to just to situate ourselves, this is the priory down here. Hopefully you can see my, my cursor. Um, we the project was primarily focusing on the early medieval material, but we, we picked up quite a lot of evidence for, for later medieval. One of the things we picked up is lots of activity in this area to the west, the west of the village. Um, we when we when we did the excavation, our first evaluation trench, we were hoping it would turn out to be early medieval. But actually, it turns out what we've got is uh, clear evidence that the medieval village extended right to the west side of the island, right, right to the west western edge and that edge is, is, is suffers active erosion so it's probably even even further further to the west than it was than it was now but there's on the geophysics you can see paddocks to the north but once you get down here in the southern part of our our geophysics we you can see there's much more um activity going on also unpublished excavations by brian hope taylor in 1962 fresh fresh from his his work at yevering he he also excavated on the western side of the island a little bit further to the south of us just to the west of the parish church and he also found uh clear evidence for medieval substantial medieval occupation and what we found suggested that this was quite a, an area of dense uh, settlement until until the 16th century now we're still kind of working on the details of precise chronology but one of the questions is does the village contract uh, due to the impact of the dissolution of the priory well, i mean there's, there's other explanations there might have been an attempt to kind of clear the area for military reasons obviously it being on, on the border is quite a militarily militarily important place in, in the 16th century but we were still these are things we're still unpick, unpicking but crucially when we excavated the site we got this is an evaluation trench so it's a small trench but we got clear evidence for medieval occupation and of concern for what we're talking about now within those buildings we've got dumps of shells mussels limpets oysters all sorts of things we've got fishbone i'll talk about that in a minute we've got whalebone uh we've also got clench bolts which are important i'll come back to in a minute again and iron fish hooks so what we've got is a very rare example of essentially a coastal fishing assemblage uh from from northumberland which, which gives us some really interesting insights into the way fishing was working on the island now, when we look at the account royal, the, the priory accounts from Lindisfarne, they're great. Holy Island, they, they're great because they give us lots of senses of the, of, of the, the scale of the fishing and, and aspects of, kind of how it was working. Hints about preservation as well. They talk about dried codfish, and we know certainly uh, on the island, fish were being dried as a preservation method. In, in, into the 19th century. So we tend to associate drying codfish, uh, we tend to think of drying fish as being a kind of Scandinavian thing, but we've got clear evidence it was happening on the island in the, yeah, even well into the post medieval period. Uh, it gives a sense of the range of fish, cod, haddock, herring, the importance of things like salmon, and, and of course the importance of, of salt uh, for preservation, to, preservation uh, purposes. Now we've done some preliminary analysis by one of our students, uh, Ellis Mallet, a couple of years ago, comparing the fish assemblage from our trench three on the left uh, with um, excavations at the visitor center by Deirdre Sullivan in, the in 1977, and then some other comparative assemblages of uh, the post-medieval assemblage from the visitor center site and, and from Jarrow as well. And you can see that, you know, all the assemblages are dominated by, by cod, which is perhaps not surprising. What's interesting is in our trench three, the trench we excavated, is herring appears to be largely absent. This might be a feature of preservation. It might be that the very fine herring bones aren't being preserved in our part of the site. We were sieving, but it was not easy to, to it's not easy to sieve. But whereas herring does appear uh, in things like um, the, the, the post-medieval, sorry, in the visitor centre excavations in the medieval period, interestingly, herring does not appear in the post-medieval uh, deposits at the visitor centre site uh, in, on, on Holy Island, 
which is odd because that's precisely the period where we know there's you know, quite important herring fisheries. It might be simply that herring is a commercial fish which is being exported on a large scale and simply not being consumed locally. But there's still a lot of work I think we need to do on kind of unpicking. There's also other fish. We're getting things like ling and John Dory, which we are assuming are probably essentially bycatches. So the fish you catch by accident when you're after, after something else, which is presumably being uh, consumed consumed locally. We've also got evidence of various boat types. So the priory account roles uh, include references to uh, specialist herring boats, herringers. Uh, 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 the word boat or navicular is used quite a lot in a fairly generic way. References to a far cost, which is a seems to be a sort of Scottish dialect term for a kind of a boat that is bigger than a cobal. We've got cobals themselves. Now cobals are these high prowled, clinker built, small rowing boats, which are typical of the Yorkshire and Northumberland coast. Seem to be the most important form of fishing boat until the the rise of the keel boats in the post medieval period. Now the word cobal itself is first attested in the 10th century as a gloss for the word navicular uh, in a little boat in the Lindisfarne Gospels. Now whether that that word applies to the word to the boat which we now know as a cobal is is not clear. But I think there certainly must have been some kind of relationship. Also, from our excavations, we were getting multiple examples of these these things. These are iron clench bolts, and these are very typically used for um, built uh, securing clinker built boats. Uh, they're very kind of distinctive type of these aren't just nails. These are very distinctive type of clenched clenched nail. And I suspect the reason why we're finding them in our in our buildings is as my 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 feelings are probably reusing boat timbers for constructional purposes. Holy Island has no trees and had no trees back then. So wood would have been uh, at a premium. So it might have been broken up ships. It might also it might also have been using um, a driftwood. And I suspect that's how the, the, the these clench bolts are getting into the structural contexts on the island. In terms of the actual fishing techniques themselves, as I said, there's a range of different ecological niches people are using. So using, they're using intertidal flats, they're using, they're, they're, they're dredging for oysters. We've got references for oyster dredges. We've got references to herring nets, specifically herring nets in the accounts. Also, we've got references to lines, long and short lines, and it and it's long lining, which is really the com most common way of fishing off the Northumberland coast for most of the medieval period, actually, and really well into the post medieval period. This involves getting very, very long lines, hundreds of metres, if not long if not longer with with lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of hooks uh baited with usually muscle but sometimes limpet uh and these this, these were the main ways of particularly catching cod um we've got uh in from our excavations we've got multiple examples of these sorry it's a very bad and unconserved uh, pre-conservation photo of these small uh hooks uh, which, which are very similar to those found in places like Great Yarmouth, places like uh, North Shields, uh, Hartlepool, they fit into that kind of category. And again, you can see from this, this excavation shot, these, these just dumps and loads of dumps of uh, mussels and, and, and limpets, which we think are probably for baiting rather than direct human consumption. And references to, you kind of visitors references to the island, even in the 18th and 19th century, talk about just the absolute piles of, of, of mussel shells in particular, uh, being used in the 18th and 19th century by by long lining fishermen. So they would have been getting through massive amounts, massive amounts of these things. Uh, and again, of course, this kind of thing, this kind of work is gendered. The men are doing the fishing and the women tend to be doing doing the baiting and looking after looking after the lines. There's also the wider kind of social context of which fishing is happening in the medieval period on the island. Now, we don't have much documentary evidence about the kind of manorial rights and things from the medieval period, but we have a small amount of uh, documentary evidence for uh, the rights of freemen on the island uh, in, from the 19th century, which I think we can so it gives us a sense of the kind of rights they probably would have had. So we know that freemen on the island had rights to collect bents, so that's, that's the grass, particularly things like flooring and thatching, obviously grazing cattle, digging stone. But importantly, they were allowed to keep, a, uh, all freemen on the island were allowed to keep a fishing boat for the catching of cod and other fish. Notice it specifically mentions cod, but not herring. 
uh, rights for drying boats and pulling them up onto common fields as well. And I think there's a really interesting discussion to be had about the relationship between fishing, which is essentially a common resource, and more formally constituted commons and rights to commons in, in, in the medieval period. But it's a reminder of, of, of the, you know, how, how important the sea is to these people. These are, these are people probably working as farmers a lot of the time, but also presumably seasonally working on the fishing. And this fantastic picture I've got here is a, a, a picture of the perambulation of the boundaries of Honey Island. I mean, it's slightly, it's slightly exaggerated. I think it's, you know, the vertical elevation is slightly exaggerated, I think we could say here. But it's it's, it's a reminder of the role of the sea and the, you know, even, as, even as late as the 19th century, the, 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 the boundaries of the island were, were, were explored um, and, and kind of perambulated with or, or per, per navigated perhaps by, by boat. And this is, an, you know, this is an island, it's about as much the sea and the waters that surround it as the, the land, the land itself. We need to factor all these things when we're thinking about the role of the role of fishing. And this extends to things like place names as well. A lot of we have we have lots and lots of very soggy place names uh, surrounding the island with a rich uh, vocabulary of um, uh, um, uh, rock rock names and references to sands. Uh, some of these stones are very important in the in the landscape. So the Riding Stone is a stone that, when it's clear of a tide, when, when once it starts seen poking above the water, it, it, it's a marker to the islanders. But it's possible to cross the causeway to the mainland. So a lot of these these islands have kind of these these surrounding place names have important uh, signification to 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 the islanders. Um, Looking very quickly now at the subsistence fishing beyond somewhere like Holy Island, it's clear that subsistence fishing is an important seasonal element to agrarian life in Northumberland in the medieval period. Now, importantly, using cobles um, means that you, because these are designed to be landed on beaches, you don't need harbours, you don't need an infrastructure. So that's an immediate challenge for when thinking about the archaeology. And what's interesting is when you look at the islands, the, the coastal villages themselves, almost all the medieval villages, their cores are set back from the coast. They are not actually coastal villages per se. I'll come explore, I'll ex elaborate on that in a second. We've got, again, we've got some documentary references. So we know that Bamborough is uh, tithing a number of settlements in North Northumberland for, uh, for fish as well as for grain. But you get a sense of the relative importance of fishing at this period when Bamborough are only getting one pound fishing tithes compared with a 15 pounds value of grain tithes. We also know there are various local appropriations of fish from, from some of the villages along the coast, known variously as cane fish or gain fish. Um, and that seems to be a local manorial exaction of fish from these presumably seasonal seasonal fishermen. We've got other hints of the way that the fishermen fishing might have become important on the island. From Long Horton, we've got a, a mid 16th century survey talked about this institution called Ploughdales, which is essentially a, a mechanism by which uh, tenement proprietors maintain separate cottages for fishermen. So essentially you've got freemen holding, basically providing accommodation for a group of four fishermen at a time and you need four men to go in a, in, in a big in a large cobalt. Um, so you seem to have perhaps a hint of starting to be a more distinct um, job as fishermen and in, by the mid 16th century and it's starting to become a, a profession rather than something you do during the down season during during the agricultural periods. Now what we do have is lots of evidence for um, temporary seasonal um, settlements right on the coast, particularly this, this, this word sea house, which is, appears repeatedly in lots of locations along the Northumberland coast. Now, most people will have heard of the village Sea Houses uh, to the south of, of Bamborough, um, which is now a little tourist town and has a, has a fishing harbour. Um, but actually, that's only one of a whole series of sea houses. There's, there's map or documentary evidence for sea houses at Scremerston, Low Newton, Craster, uh, sea houses down at Embleton, Low Hawksley, even down as far as Easton, almost almost uh, um, in, in Whitley Bay. We've also got other terms like Seaton, these little dependent settlements on the coast. Uh, and when you look at the maps, the early maps, these are always just isolated one or two little farms, if that. These are not 
village centres. We've also got references to shields or shieldings. We usually use that term shielding to be referred to upland seasonal grazing, but it's clear that shieldings are also used for seasonal fishing activities as well. And I'll show you some examples of those uh, in a minute. And it's not until the 18th century that a lot of these places become more developed fishing or, or more developed harbours. This is a classic example. This is um, sea houses, uh, the modern settlement of sea houses. It's actually part of the parish of, of, of Sunderland, North Sunderland, which lies kind of a couple of miles inland. And even as late as the mid 18th century, this tiny little group of houses here was essentially all that existed at sea houses itself. And you can see it's also in a Shoresland uh, there as well. Um, by the early 19th century, we're starting to see a, a more developing settlement uh, at sea, house, sea houses itself. And then by the time you get into the, into the late 19th century, it's quite a well-developed little village. And now it's essentially modern sea houses has eclipsed um, uh, North Sunderland, uh, really. Um, crucially, though, sea houses develops as a harbour, not initially for fishing. Both Sea Houses and Beadnell and Craster all originally had their harbour installations put in for moving mineral, whether it's quarry, quarry, quarry material or particularly for Beadnell and um, Sea Houses to move lime kiln material from lime kilns. They're only kind of co-opted for use for fishing uh, as a secondary purpose. They're, they're primarily uh, for, uh, for movement of mineral, initially for mineral extraction. Beadnell is another example of one of the little coastal harbours everyone knows from the tourist brochures. But again, the medieval core sits back from the um, from from the sea, and it's up here, this area here, that, where the modern harbour of Beadnell is, and, and the kind of focus of the modern village is up here. Um, and you can see as late as the late as the kind of 1760s, it's not developed. Take it into the 17, 1789, it's still not developed, and it only comes in a little bit later with the construction of lime kilns. And we see there you could just see that that first mole being built there, but it's 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 not initially a fishing focus. We've also got lots of these other smaller little shielding sites, which I mentioned. Um, so here up at Scramiston in North Northumberland, from the Ties map, you can see these shields being showed scattered along the coast. This is, these are the first edition to Ordnance Survey. These are this is Cheswick and Goswick to, to the north, to the north of Holy Island along the coast. And again, we've got shielings, uh, shields, shields. And I think a lot of these are probably for the seasonal salmon fisheries. Obviously, salmon are and Anadromous fish and they, they go down the tweed, they go out to the salt water, and even until very relatively recently, there is a coastal salmon fisheries, uh, particularly at Gothic. And I think that's what a lot of these small settlements probably are. Now, how far they go back into the medieval period is, is an open question. So I'm going to leave it, leave it there. Um, I think the key thing to remember is that when we look at when we look at the coastal settlement of Northumberland now. It, what we're really seeing is a post-medieval landscape. As I've said, the, the permanent coastal infrastructure at places like Craster and Beadnell and Sea Houses, these are emerging in the 18th century, so they're connected to particularly lime kilns. And again, a lot of the harbour facilities on Holy Island itself are to do with lime kilns. So arguably, this is again about the relationship between agriculture, high farming, agricultural intensification, as it is about fish. Um, it only the fishing, fishing and fisheries kind of co-opting these these spaces at, at, at second hand, because fishing is not making huge amounts of money. They don't have a capital investment available to them to to build their own harbours. They simply use harbours which are produced by by other people. And of course, there's an important kind of discussion about the emerging maritime cultural landscapes in the 18th and 19th century. Smoke houses, particularly, but salting and brining was the most common way of preserving, particularly herring, and also places down in North Shields, rolls of canning factories, chandleries, ice factories, the whole, there's a whole kind of repertoire of, of, of terrestrial buildings which are there to support the the coastal the coastal fisheries. But they only become industrialised uh, really in the in the 19th and, and early 20th 20th century. And then we get into the 20th century, late 19th century, and we have the emergence of fishing companies on a joint stock basis investing very large scale. So that's I'll leave it there. Um, I think I'm more or less on time. I'm happy to answer any questions.